Okay, we're almost through. What do I need? Oh, yeah. I get between Wednesday and the clicker and doing this. All right, we're almost through looking at the archaeological discoveries, looking at the period of Judah alone. So that's from 722 when the Assyrians finished off the northern kingdom of Israel down to the Babylonian captivity of 587. So we've been looking at archaeological discoveries relating to that period. We're just about through. but I have one more seal in that period that I want to mention to you. But before doing that, let me quickly remind you of uh, what we've seen during this period. And I'll be quick again. I did it with the last period. Here's a quick review that I'm hoping will solidify some of these things. That's the Taylor prism again. You remember that's Sennacherib's account of his campaign in, in Judah in 701 where he says those things. And here's the Lachish reliefs where you saw in Scripture that Sennacherib had taken Lachish, and there you have reliefs of that conquest. Hezekiah's tunnel that was built as Hezekiah prepared for the anticipated assault on Jerusalem by Sennacherib. There's the tunnel that he built. And here's the Siloam inscription that was chiseled off the wall of Hezekiah's tunnel, and later it was recovered in pieces. Now this and the destruction of some other artifacts that I've mentioned throughout the series of classes, this brought to Jeff's mind, Jeff Ibbotson, it brought to his mind the destruction and looting of archaeological sites and artifacts that's going on today by the Muslim group ISIS. And it really is a terrible thing. They've destroyed and looted at least five ancient sites in Syria, including Mari, which is a major site I mentioned during the, the introductory class. And they've likewise ravaged sites in Iraq, including several I've mentioned in this series, and I think I'll mention today, Nineveh, Nimrud, and Khorsabad. So they've gone in here and just been destroying these places. Uh, so it's a shame. But there's, there's that on the, uh, the Siloam inscription. There's Hezekiah's wall. You remember that was part of the wall that he built up in fortification, the anticipate of the preparing for the anticipated uh, attack. Here are some, some seals of Hezekiah. And forgive that uh, last uh, backward uh, quotation mark there. You know how that works. Whoop! It decided to flip it, and I didn't see it till this morning. But there's a Hezekiah seal. That was one of the early ones. Here you have the seal that was published in just last year that was found in excavation, not found out in a shop or something in a private collection. This was found in excavations, the seal of Hezekiah. Here's Jehuchel, son of Shelemiah, mentioned in those verses in Jeremiah. Gedaliah, son of Pasher, mentioned there in Jeremiah. These are the people who sought Jeremiah's death, and we have seals from these people. Uh, here is the Babylonian Chronicle where Nebuchadnezzar speaks of capturing the king of Judah. You know that. Lachish Ostraca, which relates to Jeremiah 34.7. The Nebo Sarsicum tablet we talked about relates to Jeremiah 39.3. The Unger Prism relates to those texts where you see Nebuzaradan is mentioned, uh, who's mentioned in Scripture. The Gamaria seal, Gamaria son of Shaphan. Uh, in Jeremiah, you see he's mentioned in those verses. The Azariah seal, Azariah son of Hilkiah, mentioned in the verses I put up there. The Baruch seal, uh, which is, I think, very interesting, mentioned in those chapters of Jeremiah. And the Jeremiel seal, Jeremiel son of, king, of the king, and that's, I think, right where we ended uh, last week. Now, right when we ended, I had mentioned that Jeremiah 36, 12 mentions Elisha the secretary as one of the king's officials who heard the reading of Jeremiah's prophecy. So this particular individual is named in Scripture, and one of the burnt house bulli that were published by Naaman Avigad includes this seal, the Elishima seal, which says Elishima, servant of the king. So that's the last one I have in that category. But the next uh, period I want to look at is the Babylonian captivity. Now you can take it from, you remember when Nebuchadnezzar comes and he, he takes people in 605, that's when Daniel goes. He takes people in 597, that's when Ezekiel goes. But then he comes in 587, and that's the destruction of Jerusalem. So he's really taken people in three stages. But I'll look at the period of captivity. I'll call it from 587, when Jerusalem is destroyed and the last captives are taken to Babylon to 539 when Cyrus the Persian comes and conquers the Babylonians. So we're looking at that period. Now the first one I'm going to look at is going to be a little bit earlier than that. It's 592, but you get the idea. I'm looking at the period of Babylonian captivity. 
in 2 Kings, in 2 Kings 24, 8 to 17, 25, 27 to 30, Jeremiah 24, 1, Jeremiah 37, 1, they reveal that the Judean king Jehoiakim, he was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, and I'd mentioned that last week or two weeks ago, and he remained in prison in Babylon until Nebuchadnezzar's death, which was around 562 B.C., and then not long after that, uh, the, the next king, evil Merodach, new king of Babylon, released him from prison, allowed him to dine at the king's table, and provided him a living allowance. And you can see that in 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 27 through 30. Now, in 1939, Ernest Wiedner, he published four Babylonian administrative tablets that were found near the Ishtar Gate in Babylon, and these four tablets date from 595 to 570, okay? Jehoiakim's taken in 597. These tablets date from 595 to 570, and these texts, they include food rations, food rations that were given to various foreign captives. So Babylonians have these foreign captives. Here's an administrative tablet that recounts the food rations given to these various captives. And one of the texts in those records, dating from 592 B.C., records the relatively large quantity of food rations given to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and his five sons. So here we have scripture telling, yes, he's, he takes him away, and here we have a Babylonian administrative record talking about the rations that he's getting. Now, Daniel chapter 5. Daniel chapter 5 indicates that Belshazzar was the last Babylonian king. Now, since other sources said nothing about Belshazzar, and they presented Nabonidus as the last Babylonian king, critics claim that this was a mistake in the Bible. Well, here's another case, you know, they, these people, they're doing this stuff after the fact, way down the road, and they got their history messed up when they were making up this story, and they created this fictional character as the last king. Well, in 1854, which is not that long ago in terms of biblical history, 1854, a tiny inscribed clay cylinder found by J.E. Taylor at Ur. He is found there at Ur, which named Baal Belshazzar the eldest son of Nabonidus. So here we have this little clay cylinder that's inscribed in Akkadian. They find that it names it names uh, Belshazzar as the eldest son, and then the tablet of the Babylonian Chronicle that relates to Nabonidus' reign from about 555 B.C. to 539, it shows that Nabonidus entrusted, quote, the army and the kingship, end quote, to Belshazzar during his lengthy absence over 10 years at faraway Tima in northern Arabia. So here we have Nabonidus. We see that he has an eldest son, Belshazzar. He goes off for 10 years, over 10 years, and he entrusts the kingship and the army to Belshazzar. So Belshazzar is the de facto king. Well, what do you know? And you actually see hints of this. Now that you see that picture, you can see hints of this in Daniel chapter 5, verses 7, 16, and 29. They contain a clue of Belshazzar's status because he promises to elevate whoever can decipher the writing on the wall to the third position in the kingdom. Wasn't that odd? I mean, you'd say, why is he going to do that? Why is he putting him in the third position? Because he's the de facto king, the one to whom the kingship has been entrusted while the other's away. And you see that, and you wouldn't know that. You'd just be going, well, that's kind of curious, the third position? But you see it, so I think that's kind of neat. Now, the return from exile, I want to look at this period. This is from 539 down to 430, we'll call it, at the beginning of the intertestamental period. So you have the Babylonians, who are the bosses. They're like the ruling power, dominant power, uh, really beginning in 612. And 587 is when they take away, uh, destroy Jerusalem, and they finish off Judah. But in 539, Cyrus, who's, of course, God's instrument, he comes and he captures the Babylonians. So I'm looking now at this period, the return from exile, from 539, from when Cyrus comes and captures them, and you have then the, the Israelites are allowed to return. 
Now, Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verses 22 to 23, they say that Cyrus allowed the Jews to return from exile after he conquered the Babylonians. So he comes in, he defeats the Babylonians, and the text, the Bible says he allowed the Jews to return home. Well, that was considered false by critics. It was considered false because they doubted that any 6th century B.C. ruler would do such a thing. They just thought that would just seem kind of crazy to, to, for somebody to say that. So again, the idea this is just another kind of story that's made up that's interesting and this kind of thing. Well, in 1879, Hormuz Rassam, who's an Iranian archaeologist who was working under the British Museum, he discovered in Nineveh a clay cylinder that was inscribed at the, at the direction of Cyrus. Now, I'm looking up here. When I told you that the Nabonidus cylinder was in Akkadian, I could be wrong about that because I see this is in Akkadian, and I could have just flipped that. So this is certainly the Cyrus cylinder is inscribed in Akkadian. Whether or not the Babylonian cylinder is likewise, I don't know. I said it was, but you just take that and toss it till you research it. Okay, so I don't, I don't remember the language. But this one, this one is inscribed in Akkadian, and it's a clay cylinder that was inscribed at the direction of Cyrus, the Persian king. And so he says, here, I want this written down. It's about 10 inches long, 5 inches wide, written in Akkadian. And Cyrus doesn't specifically mention Judah in this inscription in, on this cylinder. But, he, but he, there he reports how he returned cult images, meaning idols. He reports how he returned idols to their former sanctuaries. He talks about how he established permanent sanctuaries for those idols he returned. And he explains how he returned the former inhabitants to the lands of the various gods. So here we have the, in scripture it says, he let the Jews come home. Ah, nobody would do that. We get this cylinder where he says, no, that was exactly what I did. That was my policy. Now you can say, okay, well, I could see why you think that would be a wise policy because you would get all the goodwill from the people and you have to spend so much energy trying to oppress them. So, yes, we see this wind up. Now, Cyrus credits his god Marduk with selecting him and giving him the task of ruling the world, but he is, of course, he is God's instrument, even though he does not know God. You see, he doesn't know God, but he's God's instrument, and you can see that in Isaiah 44, 28 through Isaiah 45, Verse 6, 45, verse 4, specifies that he does not know God. And so there's a question that comes up when you see the decree that is recorded in Ezra, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. You have in there the use of Yahweh, the God of heaven, the God of Israel. You say, well, if he doesn't know God, then why is in this decree that is said to come from him, why is he using these names? Well, the answer to that, the explanation is, is that the policy of Persia at the time was if this was, decree was in response to a petition from the Jews, the policy of Persia at the time was to use the title of the god or the gods recognized by the local population. So he would take what they're saying and he would put that in the decree. That terminology doesn't mean he's a convert. Okay, that's just a footnote in case that idea ran across your mind. You say, well, why does he do this? All right, Nehemiah's wall. In 2007, Israeli archaeologist Elot Mazur, I've mentioned her a number of times, she announced that her excavations just south of the Temple Mount, that she had uncovered a small section of a wall, the construction of which she dates to the time of Nehemiah. Now let me give you a little bit of pictures here. You can see, I want to first situate you here. Here's where Mazur has been doing this work. Here's the Temple Mount. You see there's the Dome of the Rock right there. But here's this running in this north-south direction, this section right here where she's south of the Temple Mount. This is that tongue. This is the city of David. This is the oldest part of Jerusalem. And here you have the Kidron Valley. There's another valley over here. So it's like a hill that comes out as a tongue. And she's been working right in here. Now here is an aerial shot of the work here. And this is the, this is the South Tower. Here is the North Tower. Here is what she called a large stepstone structure. 
Now, she argues that this large section up here, this is the palace of David. Now, I didn't include that in the discussion about the time of David. Maybe I should have. This is still kind of up in the air, but she dates this. I'll show you part of the complexity of dating. Somebody had said, no, these things are much, er much later than that. The next season, she tied these things together. So now I think most people would say, no, that argument won't work. But there's another person who says, no, this is earlier than the time of David. So, but she's, she's confident, and she says, no, pottery and these kinds of things, I think we've got this. But more excavation is needed, but she's had to put that on hold because this north tower was in danger of collapsing. And so she had to stop and do a lot of uh, work here, and she's done some digging and things, and so we've, we've gotten some things out of that. But they haven't been, further, been able to further excavate what she claims is, is David's palace. But that's not what I'm after right now. Here's what I want to show you. Here you can see some of the complexity. You say, why? Well, this place has been here for thousands of years, and it's been inhabited. So people come in, you have wars, you have destruction, you have building, you have taking down. It's hard to piece together with confidence what's from what time. Okay, so I mean, that's the art of archaeology and the quote science. But you see here, so here you have, you have this is the, the large stepstone structure, and here you see this here where it's David's palace. She thinks that's the entryway or whatever to David's palace. And that's what I was saying before, that there's further work ought to be done, and I think she intends to do that, Lord willing. And then here you see this, this, these sections here are dated 10th to 6th century, and these are private Israelite dwellings. So this is from 1,000, this is 10th to 6th. And then she says here are these are from the 5th century, and that's when Nehemiah is, right? You remember that, that Cyrus comes in in 539, and not long after that, he issues the decree, and then the Israelites come back. Nehemiah is not till the middle of the 5th century. He's not right at that time. He's many decades later. And so she says, here is a wall based on pottery and things like that that was built up because in many places, Nehemiah repaired the wall, but here he actually constructed a wall, according to her. So there you have Nehemiah's wall, if that's right. And then here is a picture of it that this oval designates. You can see that large step structure there. And then here is the wall here that she says is the 5th century wall that, that she attributes to Nehemiah. And then here is a close-up of it right here. And it would come down this way. So if that dating's right, then there you have it. I mean, there's, there's, you know, this building of this wall right in the 5th century. But we'll see if, she, if, if things can get nailed down more than that. But as people have said, you know, archaeology, there's always stuff to argue about. And that's how so much of life is, right? I mean, there's always things you just have to say, well, what's, what do I think is better? I, I'm certain Nehemiah built a wall. I'm certain that Nehemiah, you know, does this, so, but is the wall there? Is that it? All right, it sounds to me from what Mazer's saying, yeah, that's it. But is it the slam dunk? You know, it's, I think there's still some question about whether she's tied that down well enough. Herod, King Herod, Herod the Great. So let's move to this era of, of his life. Herod's born about 72 B.C., he dies about 4 B.C., although there are some who would put his death at 2 or 1 B.C. But most people would say he dies at 4 B.C. And you're thinking, wait a minute, well, you know, Jesus is born while Herod's still alive, so why is Jesus born before 4 B.C.? Why isn't he born at zero? <laughs> well, this goes back, I'm not going to get into that, but there was a calendar error uh, from some monk. But okay, so yes, Jesus is born before BC. He's like born in 4 BC, or if you want to say 3 BC, or something like that. But Herod the Great, from, let's say from 72 down to 4. Now he's, he's the king, the great, Herod the Great ruled Judea, of course, at the time of Jesus' birth. He's the one who summoned the wise men of the Magi uh, after Jesus' birth, and the one who slaughtered the, the male children of Bethlehem when he realized that he had been tricked by the wise men. You know this, Matthew chapter 2. This is the Herod we're talking about. In 1970, Yaakov Meshurer published a limestone weight, probably from Jerusalem, bearing the Greek inscription, Year 32 of King Herod, pious and friend of Caesar, inspector of markets, three minas. 
Well, you see, we've got like a division of weights and measures, right? So apparently you had somebody here trying to control and make sure that the weights you're using to sell things or people are standardized or something. So here we have this that mentions Herod. So here we have this fellow in the Bible, and of course here we have some extra-biblical confirmation of him. 1988, Ursi Manzolinu Richards, she published a Greek inscription found in three fragments. The first fragment was found around 1874. Later, the other two fragments are found, and the inscription is from a building. The building, they think, was, it was originally in Delos, which is a town in the, an island in the Aegean. But they think that's where the building originally was, though the inscription was found in Cyrus, which is another place in the Aegean. But it's, it's there. Herod dedicates a building to people, and we have, have the building inscription says, King Herod to the people of. So we have Herod. I mean, he was, he, he was into building, and you have people doing this, and the king likes to do these things because people like it. And it says he's giving attention, and people always like the government giving them money. And so he's here doing this, and he's building these buildings and dedicating, and people are supposed to go, okay, great. You know, you're really taking care of us. So he, he did a lot of that. 1995... Alec Kushner Stein published a lead weight from Ashdod. Let me see. Can I help anybody out here? All right. We'll see if it comes on. I don't know. But she published a lead weight from Ashdod. Ashdod is west of Jerusalem on the coast. And she published a, a lead weight there bearing a Greek inscription. It says, In the time of King Herod, pious and friend of Caesar. Now, several inscriptions have been found from the people of Athens to Herod, and they describe him as friend of Romans and the pious king and friend of the emperor. Now, I didn't find any pictures of those inscriptions that I could show you, but there are a number of them along that line. I do have, though, some coins that were minted by Herod, have been found, they've been found in Palestine with the legends reading of King Herod and King Herod. And so here we have him minting coins, the very guy who's there in Scripture, and he's doing these things that we read about. And there, there you see him, you know, just some kind of tangible, physical uh, item that this person was behind. Now, Yigdael Yadin's excavations in Masada, this is in 1963 to 1965, he uncovered some, uh, some 13 broken wine jugs. They had all these jugs. They're busted up. They'd been imported from Italy. And those, of course, they're pottery jugs. They're broken. The broken pieces are called ostraca. But they've been broken. And these ostraca, they date to 19 B.C. And they have written on them in Latin, For Herod, King of the Jews. So here we have shipments of jugs of wine, obviously, going to Herod from Italy. And so he's, you know raking in. He's the king of the Jews, baby. You know, so he's a, obviously a pol powerful political figure. Now, Josephus, he reported that Herod was buried at a place called Herodium. Now, Herodium, it's an extravagant fortress and palace complex. That's three miles southeast of Bethlehem. Now, Herodium, it was first excavated, this region, this area, or site, it was first excavated by Virgilio Corbo from 1962 to 1967, but it wasn't until 2007 that an Israeli archaeologist, Ehud Netzer, discovered the long-sought tomb. Now, here you have a picture of the excavation of Herod's tomb. It was a mausoleum, which had a structure up on top of it. And so there you have the excavation of it. Now, here you can see the location of it within the larger site. This is Herodium. So you have lower Herodium, bathhouse, pool, complex, lower palace, a monumental stairway, and here's the mausoleum. And then you have the palace and fortress up here. So this is quite a complex that's been excavated. And here is a replica of what they think that the actual mausoleum looked like. Somebody has built this. And now I think it's part of the tourist scene in Israel. Now, other people, there are a couple of archaeologists in 2013 named Joseph Patrick and Benjamin Arabus. 
they challenged the claim that this mausoleum that Netzer found, that this was actually Herod's burial place, because their argument is it's too modest for such an egomaniac. And that was basically their argument. But Netzer's conclusion is still generally accepted as correct. Okay, so I just alert you to the fact somebody has said something, well, I'm not so sure, but generally it is accepted that this is, in fact, the uh, burial place or the tomb of Herod. Now, from Jesus, let's look at some stuff from Jesus' time. 4 B.C., or if you wanted to go 2, 3, see, it depends on when you, when you date the, the death of Herod, but like I say, uh, I don't know, virtually all, but vast majority put Herod's death at 4 B.C. But some people who are really sharp that I think are on the ball with this chronological stuff disagree with that, so that's a footnote there. But his, uh, whenever... Uh, so let's say, just look at Jesus' life. Now, in the late 7th century A.D., okay, so you're thinking, all right, so 600s, late 7th century A.D., there's an Irish monk named Adamnan. And this Irish monk produced a three-volume work. And that work is titled De Locus Sanctus, which is Latin for about holy places. So 7th century, this monk produces this work. Now, it was based on information that he had gathered from another monk, a monk named Arkulf, and he closely checked. This, this monk had gone to the Holy Land, and Adamnan is pumping him for information about these places he has seen in the Holy Land. And Adamnan makes a point to say that he closely checked what he was told against available sources. So he's saying, look, I didn't just tell you what this guy said. I checked him closely and I checked with available sources trying to get to what's really going on. Now, in that three-volume work, De Locus Sanctus, Adam Nan reports that there were two large churches near the center of Nazareth, one of which is clearly identifiable today as the Church of the Annunciation. The other church, which he calls in that work the Church of the Nutrition, now, see, in our society, we'd be thinking, yeah, that's right, church of the nutrition, that's where we ought to be worshiping. Now, you, you see, the church of the nutrition, meaning the church of the upbringing of Christ. You see, that's what, that's what this church is. Now, it, it's there, so you have these two churches. One is the church of the Annunciation. The other is the church of the nutrition or the church of the upbringing of Christ. He says it was near the church of the Annunciation, and it was built over vaults or caverns. It was built over these vaults that contained a spring and the remains of two tombs. And he says, between those tombs over which this church was built, so it's under the house, was the house in which Jesus was raised. All right, so this is 7th century. This is what he's saying. This is the scoop from this pilgrim who's over there, and he's, he's telling it. Now, the Sisters of Nazareth Convent, it's, it, it's maybe a hundred yards away from the Church of the Annunciation. So in this book, he says it's near, and the, the, church, the, the Sisters of Nazareth Convent is maybe a hundred yards away from the Church of the Annunciation. Now, there were some limited and amateur excavations done at the Sisters of Nazareth Convent, in the later 19th century, it was done by nuns and their workmen. And then again in 1936, some was done by a priest. But the first serious professional excavation, it began with the Nazareth Archaeological Project in 2006, headed by the Cambridge-trained archaeologist Ken Dark. And he reported in an article in 2015 in Biblical Archaeology Review, that his excavation of the cellar of the Sisters of Nazareth convent, that that excavation revealed precisely what had been described in De Locus Sanctus. That is, there was evidence of a large Byzantine church. Okay, Byzantine typically runs from, let's say, 330, and then you can take it all the way down to the fall of Constantinople in 1453, or if you want to divide it up to maybe the beginning of the Crusades in 1095, you can take it from 330 to 1095. 
but that's the range you're kind of talking about. Okay, so he says here that there was a, there was a uh, large Byzantine church had been built over a chamber. That chamber housed two tombs and a spring, and between those two tombs was a first century Jewish home which was cut into the limestone hillside and was completed with stone-built walls. So it was cut out into the limestone and then there was more added to it. It's a first century Jewish home here under this Byzantine church as was described there. Now both the Byzantine church and there was a subsequent church, a crusader church, so one that would have been built after 1100. So both of those churches, they, they were constructed with clear regard for the home. In other words, when they're building, it wasn't like they said, what do we care? We're just going to build wherever. They built clearly around this structure. And I think that's significant. Ken Dark says, the excellent preservation of this rectilinear structure or house can be explained by its later history. Great efforts have been made to encompass the remains of this building within the vaulted cellars of both the Byzantine and Crusader churches so that it was thereafter protected. So here you have the people, whoever these Byzantine church builders are, they are very consciously trying to encompass this and protect it. Well, here is the rock-cut doorway, the first century. The doorway is original. The rock-cut doorway of this home, and I'm looking for what I did with my little thing. Oh, there you go. Thank you. This doorway, and right in here, you see, he says here, Dark says, in front of the doorway, a fragment of the original floor survives. So this is the first. Now, he concludes his article this way. He says, at the Sisters of Nazareth convent, there was evidence of a large Byzantine church with a spring and two tombs in its crypt. That's that cavern under the church. The first century house described at the beginning of this article, probably a courtyard house, stands between the two tombs. Both the tombs and the house were decorated with mosaics in the Byzantine period, suggesting that they were of special importance and possibly venerated. Only here have we evidence for all the characteristics that the locus sanctus ascribes to the church of the nutrition, including the house. Was this the house where Jesus grew up? It's, possible to, it, it's impossible to say on archaeological ground. How could you? When you come in and you say, we have this history, it was celebrated that way for a long time. We have history that tells us this church is built over what was thought that way. We go down there and we find a first century Jewish home there. But what else, what else do you think you're going to find? Do you think you're going to find a sign that says Jesus was here? <laughs> you won't. So can somebody always say, well, I'm not convinced. All right. All right. You know, what can I say? But isn't it interesting? I find it interesting. He says, on the other hand, there's no good archaeological reason why such an identification should be discounted. There are people that want to discount it. Why? Because the Bible's junk. Anything that comes anywhere near to saying that it's true, junk. So my standard of proof is up here. I want metaphysical certainty until you can convince me. All right, well, that's not how we go about life especially when you're doing historical investigation. If that's going to be your standard, you might as well chuck it. Because people, you know, you can say, George Washington around? Oh, yeah, how do you know? Oh, I got all this stuff faked. <laughs> I know we got faked, lies, all fabricated to build strength in the nation. All right, you, do you see how you can do that? You can raise the standard of proof so high that it becomes impossible through historical inquiry to meet it. All right, so I just think it's interesting, so to see. All right, what, what we can say is that this building was probably where the Byzantine church believers believed Jesus had spent his childhood in Nazareth. And you say, okay, Byzantines, pretty, you know, from 330 on, but you wonder how long do these, these recollections stay in cultures? Do you think that that, that that long ago, do you think, well, they completely lost and nobody had any idea? Uh, I'm inclined to think these kinds of things would stay on, and the fact that these people understood it that way is, to me, significant. All right, Jesus is mentioned as teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. He's mentioned that way in Mark chapter 1, verse 21, Luke 4, 31 to 35, John chapter 5, 6, verse 59. And a lime, large limestone synagogue 
was discovered in Capernaum that was long thought to be from the first century. But in the 1970s, it was determined that that limestone synagogue was in fact from the 4th and 5th centuries. So too late to have been there when Jesus was there. But in 1975, excavators discovered black basalt walls under the four corners of that limestone synagogue. And further work on that revealed that these walls are four feet thick, which is much too thick for a uh, private dwelling. And associated pottery there demonstrates that the basalt structure was built in the first century. Now you recall in Luke chapter 7 verses 1 to 5 that a centurion was praised for having built the synagogue in Capernaum. So here we have a first century uh, basalt non-residential building built under a fourth or fifth century uh, limestone synagogue. And it's, that's from the first century. And the underlying structure is the same size as the limestone synagogue. And it's laid out like the limestone synagogue. Now those reasons and the tendency to build religious sites on existing sites have convinced a, a large number of people, uh, many people, that the, the, basalt structure, the basalt structure is a first century synagogue on which was later built that limestone synagogue of the 4th and 5th century. Archaeologist John McRae, for example, he says it, quote, is certainly the remains of the synagogue in which Jesus preached. So that's, that's his conclusion, and he's not alone. Now, there are some people who aren't yet convinced it's a synagogue. Okay, you say, well, prove to me it's a synagogue. You know, I imagine that's not the easiest thing to do. And so you say, well, why do you think they built this thing right on this thing? Well, I don't know, maybe. All right, you see how that works. But most people, I think, or a large number of people, accept that that is, in fact, the first century synagogue. And if that's the case, we're looking right there where the Lord taught. The Lord walked by those very things. And I just think that's cool. Uh, Matthew 18, um, 8, Matthew 8, verses 14 and 15, Mark 1, 29 to 31, Luke 4, 38 and 39. They report that Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law while staying at Peter's house in Capernaum. And that evening he healed the sick and the demon-possessed who gathered at the door. And this presumably is where he also healed the paralytic who was lowered through the roof as reported in Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Well, in 1968, Virgilio Corbo and Stanislaw Lafreda, they began investigating a 5th century octagonal church that's located just 84 feet from the synagogue in Capernaum. Now, during the Byzantine era, which of course includes the 5th century, octagonal churches, they often were built over what were understood to be sacred, sacred sites in the Holy Land. Now, beneath this octagonal church, there was a 4th century church, and beneath that church was a house dating to the middle of the first century. The walls of that house are narrow, and it is judged by people who presumably understand these things. It is judged that it would not have been sufficient to support a masonry roof, meaning that the roof of that house would have been made of branches covered with earth, just like the one that's implied in Mark chapter 2, verse 4, where they come through the roof. You see, now the walls, the ceiling, and the floor of the central room of this house had been plastered in the first century. That's not terribly common. The walls, the floor, and the ceiling of the central room of this house had been plastered in the first century, and that's what was done with public rooms that were used for special purposes. It's the only house known in Capernaum to have plastered walls, and the walls and floors had been replastered at least twice. Now that's significant. In the mid-first century, there was a change in the pottery that is used in that room, indicating that a change 
it had changed from normal residential living. So first you have certain kinds of pottery that reflect people just living there. But after the middle of the first century, with some span, obviously what you mean by middle, but there was a change. The room is plastered, number one, but you also see a change in the use of the room that is reflected in the, in the pottery. More than 150 inscriptions were scratched in the plaster walls in Greek, Syriac, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latin, beginning in the second century and possibly even earlier. And these inscriptions include appeals to Christ for help, possible references to Peter, and various Christian symbols like crosses. Now sometime after the first century, the roof of this central room was raised up. It was extended and raised up, and the fifth century octagonal chapel is centered on that room, built right around that, that central room. And this is the only house in this area of Galilee that has been identified by archaeologists, pilgrims, and ancient tradition as Peter's house. Now, many scholars are persuaded by the evidence that this is indeed Peter's house. Are there people that aren't? Of course there are, but that's what I'm telling you. Because they're saying, well, no, I, I want something here that you know, is a level of proof that I would expect from nothing else. All right, now here is James Charlesworth. He's a very well-known scholar. And Charlesworth says, archaeological evidence is almost always hotly debated. What then is clear? The, quote, house church, end quote, in Capernaum that is celebrated as Peter's house may well be the house in which Jesus taught. It is certainly not a synagogue, but it seems to be Peter's house. Thus, I fully agree with J. Murphy O'Connor, who is unusually well informed of data relating to Jesus and archaeology and astutely critical. He's a very well-known Catholic scholar, uh, spent on a great deal of time. He's written books about the Holy Land. But he says here, uh, J. Murphy O'Connor, he says, notice his judgment. Now, this is J. Murphy O'Connor. The most reasonable assumption is the one attested by the Byzantine pilgrims, namely, that it was the house of Peter in which Jesus may have lodged, and he has a mistaken site there. Certainly nothing in the excavations contradicts this identification. So you have this long tradition. You have all of these indications of the plaster and the inscriptions going back to the second century, maybe even into the first century. You have the change of use. You have it located where it is. You have the church built on it. And so you say, well, yeah, you know, that, look, that looks like pretty good stuff to me. But somebody said, I'm not convinced. What do you think, Peter didn't live? I mean, <laughs> you know, you think, you think Peter's just made up? People writing these stories? Yeah, you know, Peter there. What, Peter? I'm from there. I don't know anything about Peter. What are you talking about? You think that's how it went? No. All right, that's not how it went. John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And I know I won't get through this because I see that clock over there. But I'm going to keep talking. Bell rings and we'll carry on next time, Lord willing. All right, John chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. It says that when Jesus was on his way to Galilee... He came to Jacob's well at Sychar in Samaria, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now, in Genesis chapter 33, verses 18 and 19, Joshua 24, verse 32, they locate that field that he gave them, they locate that field at Shechem. All right, so that's a geographical, that's, that's an important thing, and we'll carry on next week. Thanks for coming.